guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory of the Lord so round about them, and they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I pray that the words that I speak and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, first and foremost, God. Thank you for a wonderful year here at Harris Park Bible Church. And allow people of this fine place of your house, Lord, to be blessed under my preaching, under Alex's leadership, and under your grace. And allow us to step fully into everything that you have called us to be as your sons and daughters. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. So Linus set me up really well for what we're going to be discussing today. Because if you notice, he opened up the chapter 2 of Luke, which is a story about Christmas. And each of the Gospels records this. But I believe in Luke 2, when we dive in today, there's a timely message for us. So we're going to be turning to Luke, if you have your Bible or in the app on your phone, which a lot of you do nowadays. Luke chapter 2, and we'll be reading verses 15 through 19. So let's read in the word of the Lord. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 15, When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then, and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they had made known the statement which had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. Today's timely message, I believe, from Luke chapter 2, verses 15 to 19, is in light of a Christmas season that's been upon us, where we are seeing a season where we're coming out of COVID with the vaccine. We're seeing a season where businesses have been lost and hopes and dreams have been lost. But also, I believe, into a new season that God has for us into next year. Amen, brother. And right now is a time for us as the body of Christ to reflect on that. Because the good news that Linus spoke about in the message is good news for all people, for all places, and for all times. And I believe that this good news, that this good news brings us, it guides us, like the star guided the wise men, this good news guides us to godly responses. I believe this good news that is for all people in all places and all times guides us to godly responses. And I think there's three people groups we want to look at when we're talking about these <laughs> godly responses that we have. Bless you. There's three people groups we want to consider in this story, and that's what I want to go through today with you in the story of Christmas. So if we dive back in, to verse 15, we see 
Now the first group of people we want to consider is the shepherds. Now I want to contextualize this because in our modern day era, especially in the West, we have a hard time understanding the role of a shepherd. We, we talk about him in church settings, but the shepherd, even in a modern day sense, still operates in many of the similar ways that the shepherd did back then. Huma and I were actually in a class together called Pastoral Care and Counseling, where our uh, teacher, Chaplain Eve, actually walked us through some of and contextualized the role of the shepherd. The shepherd in the days of the Bible was someone who traversed in very high altitude areas, just like this in Colorado. And they would be in charge of overseeing a several hundred head of flock of sheep. And they would know, based on their knowledge and their experience that they gained as being shepherds, they would know the safe locations where sheep were to graze, where they would get water, where they could thrive and live. And this wasn't their flock, but they treated it like their flock. That's why we have so much depiction of Jesus being the great shepherd, because in the same way, he made sure that we thrive in our own lives. So this idea that shepherds were in the fields tending responsibly to the sheep that they were in charge with is endearing to us because it shows that these shepherds at this time of the day could have been drinking, they could have been just partying, they could have been doing any number of things, but instead they were astonished by the presence of the angels that came about them before verse 15. They were shocked, but they were just guarding their fields. The shepherds were guarding their sheep. And this is who God chose in his first selection of to tell the good news that brings us closer to godly responses. This is the people group. A people group that didn't have an education. The people group that knew how to birth sheep and take care of them and fight off you know, wolves and lions and bears, oh my... This is the first group, the rejects, the outcasts, that God chose to use. And I think there's two responses that we see the shepherds having. The first response that we see in verse 15 is an obedience, an immediate obedience. When we read it says, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Do you ever stop and think about how immediately you do things in your life? If you have a test coming up, it's whom and I finished up finals. I procrastinate on my test. I'll be honest. And study. And I procrastinate on my sermon sometimes, too. I've gotten better about that, though. Huma is a dedicated student. She's very good at study. She does very well. She studies very hard. But if I know I have a test coming down the road, I tend not to study till two or three weeks out. Where in your own life do you know things that are of importance coming up down the road? How, how much time and effort do you put towards those things? How much concern and haste do you put towards those things? Is it immediate? Or is it, oh, now I understand there's priorities that we want to make for certain things in our lives. The difference between my wife saying something like, hmm, maybe I think you should do this, and then one of my friends saying it, I prioritize my wife's needs over my friends. Wouldn't you, you would agree with that? She's laughing back there, but that's a <laughs> confirmation. <of> that. <laughs> but it's, it's this idea that what is important we ought to prioritize. And so the obedience is then followed through with that. And so the shepherds didn't sit there and say, hmm, this was wonderful news. I think we'll sit and think on this for a while. They said, let us go. They, they came together. They conglomerated and said, let us go and see this thing that happened that was told to us, made known to us now. Now, there's some speculation in the scholarly, scholarly realms as to the location and the distance. But regardless, whether it was a short distance to Bethlehem for them, or a long distance, they went. They went as soon as they were told. So obedience is one of the godly responses we see the shepherds take on. Obedience to a message given to them. And then the second one I love, because as we go through this, it says, so they came in a hurry, showing that urgency, that sense of need, the sense to go and see 
the Savior. And I might add on with that this sense of hurry. In other translations, it says haste. Haste. This idea that this needs to be the first immediate thing we do. As we spend time, friends, in the Christmas season, and it's been a very busy, very crazy, very hectic, uncertain year, I think we can get into a mindset that says, I just want to be done with this year and on to the next we want to hasten through things that I think God wants us to slow down. I think that he wants us to slow our pace, to reflect. I know for me personally, in December, my time of reflection is now, I was sharing this with Alex the other day, December is a time for me to step away from everything that has happened through the year and reflect upon it. And I'll actually be touching base on that a little later. But I think... Our ability to hasten certain things and prioritize certain things is certainly needed. So before we think about gathering or gifts or getting it all done during the Christmas season, I would invite you to change your mindset and instead ask yourself, are you going to the manger? Are you going to Jesus before all that and help us gather in the right areas? So going back into scripture, it says in verse 16, So they, they, they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them about this child. They made known to them everything. It's this idea that the secondary godly response that we see the shepherds take on is to be the first evangelist. They testified to what God had done and what he was doing, to what they witnessed and experienced. It's this idea that they experienced something so good, they heard about something so good, they just had to tell somebody. Those of you who have been parents and are parents now, you understand this idea. Your son or your daughter, in your case, Alex, comes to you and says, I'm engaged. And who do you want to tell? When my mom, when we got married, when we got engaged, we had to wait a couple days because we had to make sure everybody knew before we shared on social media and everything. But then my mother, as dedicated as she is, and you've met my mom, some of you have, she went on Facebook and she said, I can't contain my excitement. My son is engaged in getting married. It's this idea that this joyous news, it overwhelms and fills our hearts. And we can't help but share it with other people. Yet in our life with Jesus, I think sometimes as believers, we sometimes make that a small thing. We sometimes make it a, uh, you know, I'm saved. Rather than this news that the shepherds are bearing and testifying to, this amazing news that they've been waiting for for so many years. Israel has waited so long. They've been promised it so long, like Alex mentioned. And now the shepherds who know about it can't help but go and tell other people about it. I think about it in this way when I was a kid, um, and this might be dating me a little bit. I'd go into Walmart, and this is when they had lobsters in the tank still, live lobsters. Yeah. So uh, you may not remember that. But they had live lobsters, and we would go to the bakery section with my brother and myself, and we would go and get a cookie every time. We went to Walmart, so that was a fun little treat for us. And I was smarter than my brother sometimes, and I would nibble on the cookie and try to enjoy it just very much, and, and my goal was to try and make it last as long as I could. My brother loved just eating the cookie, just going to town. So his cookie was gone within five seconds. But I liked, like, savoring it. But inevitably, sometimes my brother then would look at me longingly for the cookie I had in my hand. <laughs> I can't say for sure if I ever shared or felt inclined to share the cookie. But it's this idea that something so good and so rich is not intended to be taken on alone and enjoyed by ourselves. The very fact that the angels gathered together and shared it with shepherds shows us that the Father had a heart to share that with the world. And he wanted the shepherds to bear witness to it, to take it all in. So it was this idea of testifying to the goodness of God. So obedience, immediate obedience, and testifying are two godly responses we see the shepherds take on. Things that 
we should ask ourselves, are we immediately obeying what God has called us to in this season? And are we testifying to what God has done for us? Because that encourages other people. And that also gets us out of our own rhythms, out of our selfish thoughts. I notice when I take on prayers for other people and begin to ask what they need prayer for, the problems that I have in my life become insurmountably small. And it's not because my problems have gone away, friends. It's because I focus on other people's needs. And I begin to see that God answers their prayers. And He's answering mine. And that He's faithful continuously throughout a year where we've had a pandemic and a crazy election and crazy cultural things happening. And, and, and this and that. Yet God has been, remained faithful to answer the prayers that I'm asking for. And those that He hasn't, he will continue to answer throughout a lifetime walking with Him. So obedience. That's one. And then we see testifying to God's goodness being another godly response. Because that's what the good news will do. It will guide us to godly responses. So the next group, if we're looking at three groups, the shepherds would be the first group. And then we go back into Scripture and it says in verse 18, And all who heard about it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. This is the, I call them just the crowd. The general audience. This is a group that we want to consider because we also can find ourselves in the places they found themselves in. Not so much a godly response. They were certainly amazed. It says amazed. The word, the Greek word for amazed and it's used throughout the Gospels, all four Gospels, is euthymosin. Euthymosin. And we can see it heavily used throughout. And it follows many times in the Gospels after Jesus has done something incredible. The crowds were amazed. They were awestruck. They pondered. They, they comprehended. They said, who is this that he can forgive sins? That's euthymosin. That is what this audience is wrestling with. And so for us, in our day and age, what we can think and tend to do is be amazed at what God is doing and then forget about it. This is what that group, I'm not assuming all people in this group did this, but seeing that word used through the Gospels, we know that the, there was two responses to Jesus' actions. Yay, he did it, or, oh no, he shouldn't have done that. That's out of the ordinary. Euthamasin. Amazed. Another word we could use is perplexed. They were wondering why he did that or how he could do that. And I think in our lives sometimes we can find ourselves in the similar seasons I can, like the audience, where we look at God and what he's done, and he's done something amazing in our lives, and it's amazing, but then we kind of hold back after it happens. Or we go through a few seasons of life after something incredible has happened, a miracle has occurred in our lives, we go through several, several seasons where it's hard and difficult, and then we forget. We forget what God did initially for us. See, Euthamasin, Christ was already creating that when he was born. Isn't that crazy? That the Savior who walked the earth and did ministry for three and a half years and was creating all these times of Euthamasin was doing it at his initial birth through the shepherds. We should seek to always be amazed at what the Father is doing in our lives. We should always and never lose sight of the wonders and the mysteries and the things that God is doing for us Amen, day brother. by day. Amen, brother. And when we do, I love, and I've said this before from this pulpit, that grace all the more abounds, just like Paul talks about. Yet we should seek Moments like that. And in a godly response, remember that those moments will continue to come as we walk by the Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you, Paul writes. And so that Spirit will never leave us perplexed. It will never leave us in a state of euthymosin, but instead of amazement, and then from there into gratitude. So we want to avoid that, that audience response of amazement and then forgetting. Instead, we want to engage with it wholeheartedly and soak it in, saturate in it. We really want to let it sit. When they make wine, 
the best way to make wine is in barrels. And when they start making wine, aged wine, especially wine, I used to work at um, a hospitality location venue that was for very, very, very affluent people. And people would come across all over the world, and they would come to drink wine down in the cellar that was, that was owned by Johnny Morris that I've shared, with, uh, shared about with you. And they would come and drink wine. The most expensive bottle of wine that I ever had, um, that I ever had the pleasure of serving someone, was $5,000. A bottle of wine. And so these, this is the amount and the cost of this wine. But what would happen is, is Johnny came up with a way to offer a glass, just a glass, of this very expensive wine to an individual. And obviously a glass is less than a full barrel, so he could afford to give it out in that way. But all that to say, these bottles of wine were stored in barrels. And the way that they saturate in the barrel allows them to have a good flavor and a taste and a body. It's very, very good to drink. Very sweet or very dry, depending on the palate and preference you have. That's the kind of saturation we need to have in our lives. To avoid this euthamas and this just of initial amazement and then forgetting. We need to saturate ourselves continuously in the Word of God. We need to saturate ourselves in what He's been doing in our lives. And then like the shepherds, like I shared before, we testify to that to others. So they too can saturate in what God is doing. Avoiding euthamasin, this initial amazement and then forgetfulness, is right and proper godly response to the good news. So then if the audience is the second, then of course the last is Mother Mary. Because it says, going back into the scripture, but Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. There's a lot of commentary on Mary and what she does. Because this comes up again after Jesus goes to the temple. And says, don't, you were looking for me, but didn't you know I was at my father's house? And again, she ponders and she thinks and she considers. Since Kim isn't here, but she's here with us, she could insightfully provide for you exactly what Mary is experiencing here. Because she is a mother of 12 wonderful children. And each of them, I'm sure Kim can attest to, has their own unique story of birth, their own unique story and placement. And Kim could testify to you each of their experiences and see them growing up and see them becoming the people that they're raised to be. See, moms have an inherent ability as moms, and by right of being a mom, to just remember and hold some things that I know someday I will not be able to hold. I can't remember certain things as it stands, so with children I'm sure I'll remember the biggest things but my wife will be the one who can remember the smallest details, the medical bills and the medical issues and everything. I'll just, I just shuffled that off on my wife already for me, so that's probably inevitably what's going to happen when we have children. Sounds normal. <laughs> but see, moms have this innate ability, my own mother has it too, to hold these things and ponder them and think on them. What they're doing, and this is the godly response is reflection. Mary's reflection in what is going on in the life that she is living that God is bringing forward to her. And this reflection can only be done by the godly response of faith. Mary's faithfulness throughout the process is what has ingrained her in this biblical text. Faithfulness not only to be told that she was going to have the Son of God, but she said immediately after that, let the Lord's will be done to me, just as he said. Immediate faith. Despite the culture she lived in, where she was probably gossiped about after that, she was probably, you know, besmirched, her reputation ruined in some ways, and yet she chose each day to remain faithful to what God had called her to. She chose to sing a song of joy, it says in Scripture in the Gospels. Her immediate response was a song of thankfulness. It's this idea of faithfulness that we ought to have 
not just in the Christmas season, but throughout a life, throughout a whole season of our life. Faithfulness, friends, is the godly response that Mary took up. Now, they speculate, scholars and historians speculate, that the journey that they undertook, that Joseph and Mary took, to Bethlehem, took about four days. Pregnant, on the back of a donkey, assumedly, <laughs> and probably walking some. And so, my wife and I live in Lakewood, and I did the math, and so from here to our place is about 39, 40 miles. So you're talking about there and back is 80 miles. So that's close-ish to the 90 miles we're talking about that's approximated in a four-day. And we can make it out here in an hour. Now, Alex, since Kim's not here, I'm going to ask you this and put you on the spot. Do you think Kim would be up, you know, granted she has another child, she's about to give birth, maybe a month out from giving birth, do you think she'd be willing to hop on the back of a donkey and travel to my wife and I's place and then back again? Actually, yes. Okay. Uh, she's uh, the most unusual, and actually, the closer she is to delivery, the more she wants to walk because that's a great way to yep. induce labor. Mm -hmm. So uh, she actually walked a ton with all of them, but particularly with Emma, we actually went on hikes and walking uh, on the, something that she did a lot with all of you because uh, you get to this point where you want the baby. You know, we were talking about anticipation, hope, and waiting. You get to this point where you really want to meet the wonderful child you're going to raise. And um, my wife has many things. Patience isn't her strength. So uh, getting that baby out, you try anything under the sun. And the most effective found, thing she found was walking. So if she were Mary and it was really close to her due date, uh, she, would have, she actually wouldn't even be on the donkey, although the bouncing of the donkey helps too. She would have been on foot, you know, saying, come on, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so Kim might be the exception in that she just by right of being Kim. But nonetheless, many I know wouldn't necessarily think that's the most ideal situation to be in. Four day journey, being pregnant, mm -hmm. on the back of a donkey, certainly uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And yet, faithfulness. And then like I said before, like I hinted at before, reflection is the second godly response that Mary took on. Faithfulness followed up by reflection. Can you think in your life how many times we can continue to be faithful, but we don't take time to reflect? I want to walk through a season of reflection in December. That's why I choose December, because I have a whole year to look back on. This year, I have a whole year to look back on, despite COVID, that our store at Chick-fil-A remained open. A whole year to look back on that despite all the ups and downs, Kayla and I have continued to make new friends at the seminary, in our personal lives. I'm going to look back on a whole year where my parents have been traveling on the road and witnessing to people, doing things that they never thought they'd get to do for the kingdom of God. I want to walk back and look on a whole year in January, starting out here, standing right here in a suit and tie, nervous as heck, before you find people and preaching my first sermon. I want to walk through a whole year of experiencing discussions with Alex and mentoring Ian and hearing Becky's testimony. I want to walk through a whole year and reflect on what God has done, what He's been faithful in. That's the kind of reflection that you want to find yourself in. A heart of reflection that Mary found herself in. A heart of reflection that doesn't care that COVID overrode our plans for this year. It might have overridden your hopes and dreams for this year. The election might have made you mad, might have made you angry, might have made you anxious. Perhaps a relationship didn't go the way you wanted it this year. Perhaps a child didn't respond to God in the way you were hoping. Perhaps a spouse is still not wanting to come to church. Perhaps your parents still refuse to support your hopes and dreams. But has God still been there? Amen, brother. Amen. 
can you still reflect and see that the goodness of God doesn't change because of our season? Amen, brother. Because of a pandemic? Because of a job loss? Because of relationships that are hard and difficult? See, that's the kind of reflection that Mary took on. That's the kind of godly response that Mary took on, is reflection. And I believe that the last thing that Mary did with all this, taking all this in, seeing her son grow and to be a man, even during the time at the cross, this isn't openly stated, but I believe, knowing that she stood at the cross and saw all this happening, that she still had a heart of thankfulness out of the reflection that she took on. That is why it's important to reflect. Reflect on the year. It doesn't have to be at the begin, at the end of the year. Perhaps it needs to be every now and then. Perhaps you need to pause amidst your studies or amidst your school or amidst your classes or amidst your job. You just need to pause. Take it all in. Ponder it. Think and reflect on God's goodness in your life. See, reflection allows us to step away from all the mess and all the things that we can look and say complain about and find find things to make make the biggest mountains that are actually molehills in our life and realize that God's faithfulness has been so good to us and that this day from this text for this reason that we light the candles God came down as Emmanuel to be with Amen, brother. Nice. To be with us. God chose in that very moment, some 2,000 years ago, to be with you and I. To walk just as we have walked. Other texts say, biblical texts say that we have seen the glory of God, the goodness of God. We've seen it. He's walked amongst us. He's made His dwelling among us. He chose to do that. That we could be in right standing with Him. See, the good news, it guides us just like the star to godly responses. Faithfulness. Reflection. Obedience. Testifying. That's what I invite you guys to do this year. At the end of the year. Crazy year. To do all these things walking into next year and knowing, and I believe, knowing that the body of Christ here at Harris Park Bible Church in Park County will make a difference for this community and for those that are in desperate need of the gospel. You guys are already doing that. You guys have been faithful in the food pantry despite all the issues. You have been faithful in attending. You've been faithful in attending even through Zoom. And I believe that will launch this church with leadership from Alex here into a new year where we can see more people attend Harris Park Bible Church, come and be a part of the food pantry ministry at Harris Park Bible Church, and make a kingdom impact here in Park County. I believe that for you guys. I know that that is what will be done in this place. If we can take time to reflect on the goodness of God. Let's pray together.